Good morning, everybody. It's uh, 9.50, so I think we will um, get started. I'm sure a few people will uh, continue to filter in uh, as we get going, but I just wanna go over um, a few things quickly before we start. Uh, first of all, this meeting is being recorded, so um, we will send out an e a follow-up email um, probably sometime next week with the links to uh, this video as well as the concurrent sessions. So if you um, were interested in some of the other sessions as well, you will be able to um, view recorded videos of those. Uh, we also ask that you stay muted throughout the presentations. If you have any questions, please type them into uh, the chat box and Heather and Seth will uh, answer the questions throughout the presentation, but we also will have a uh, question and answer session towards the end. Um, and we suggest that you use speaker view um, as a setting uh, throughout, throughout the presentation. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Seth Rollblade of Cape Cod Fisheries Trust and Heather Goldstone of the Woodwell Climate Research Center. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Jack. Um, Seth and I got together uh, about a week or so ago um, to chat about this and um, uh, discovered uh, fortuitously, probably not by accident, um, that we were very much aligned on uh, what we would like to talk with you about and also about how we would like to do that. And especially since we've got this nice, relatively small group, we'd really like to make this morning as interactive as possible and as responsive to your questions and challenges as possible. So. Um, I would say that the presentation portion of things, uh, I'm going to try to keep it short. I'll, <clears throat> I'll open with a few things, a uh, few thoughts. Uh, Seth can respond to those, and then we would love to, to dive into um, your, your questions and, and thoughts. So let's see, by way of a little bit of, of introduction um, uh, about myself and how I ended up uh, being asked to, to do this panel. Um, I started my career actually as a scientist, got a PhD at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution um, in ocean science. Um, so ocean, uh, oceans are my, my first love, uh, but I discovered in the process of doing my PhD that probably the lab was not the right place for me and uh, jumped over to journalism, spent a few years in transition, and then spent a little over a decade working um, at uh, WCAI, now just CAI, um, the public radio station uh, in Woods Hole and with our uh, mothership WGBH up in Boston, um, covering science broadly, uh, but uh, a lot of my time focused on climate change. And then a few years ago started really feeling like um, I, I really wanted to be spending all of my professional time and effort on the issue of climate change. Um, I had followed through my reporting the work of uh, then Woods Hole Research Center um, and really uh, just loved the, the approach of working in partnership um, with a variety of, of stakeholders and decision makers, um, and so made the shift there um, and now lead uh, our communications activities at Woodwell Climate Research Center as you guys may know, uh, we changed our name in, in 2020. Um, so, so I've kind of been, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there are just two sides. I've been on a few different sides of this whole equation of trying to communicate around um, environmental issues as a scientist, as a journalist, and now um, as, as someone who kind of works in that bridge between the scientists and um, journalists. So, um, I would like to start in terms of any advice we give by saying, I don't think that there is a silver bullet or one way to do this right. So I think what we'd like to offer this morning are some questions you need to ask yourself when trying to figure out how best to communicate your work through journalists. Um, so the first is um, know yourself, know what it is really clearly the message that you are trying to get out there, um, get it as clear and as simple as you can. I'm not saying oversimplify, I'm not saying dumb it down. Just make sure you're really clear on what the message is you're trying to get out there. And then of course, um, 
you know, the, the lessons of, of any public speaking, know your audience. Um, and uh, in terms of knowing your audience, um, I think the first thing to realize is that journalists are in fact not your audience. They may be the person that you're speaking directly to, but in actual fact, those journalists are an avenue to the audience you actually want to reach, right? So yes, you need to be developing resources that support journalists. You need to be aware of um, how to get their attention and how to help them tell the story. Um, but I would encourage you to think about journalists as um, a partner here in trying to reach an audience that they um, that they have um, uh, I would say at their disposal, but everybody's competing for attention, so that may not be the case, right? So um, really think about who is that end audience that you're trying to reach. Again, get as specific as possible about that. We are increasingly in our work um, going beyond saying, okay, we're trying to reach policymakers to say, what kind of policymakers? Are we actually trying to reach the decision makers or are we trying to reach their staffers? Who is that person? What motivates them? Where are they reading? What are they doing? Um, and really getting to the to the point of, of you know, developing actual personas um, for the people that we are trying to reach with our information so that we can tailor those messages more clearly. Because I think the other thing to realize is that there is, um, I don't know if there ever was, but certainly at this point, um, I, I think the idea that uh, you can tell one grand story um, and reach everybody with that um, has been thoroughly debunked. And so it's more about telling the right story to the right people. And you're probably gonna have to do that multiple times to reach multiple people. Um, so the front page of the New York Times is great, but even that isn't necessarily going to reach everybody. So again, thinking really specifically about who you're trying to reach and what is the the version of your message that's likely to resonate there. And then um, I think the last thing I will say before handing it over to Seth um, is to, to say, um, build relationships with journalists um, so that you have a better understanding of um, what their constraints are, what their interests are, what their editor's interests are, so that they better understand what your work is, how it's progressing, when there might be opportunities to tell the story, right? Don't only reach out to journalists when you have a press release, really try to figure out who are the journalists who are in the best position um, to get to the audiences that you wanna to get to and, um, and actually de develop some relationships there that can, can really come in handy. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Seth. Thank you, Heather. Um, night, really nice to be with everybody and to see some familiar names and some familiar faces too. Uh, really nice to be all together on this. Uh, so some of you know me. Uh, I came out of a, a early career in print journalism in small papers on Cape Cod. Uh, was lucky enough to move into both early television, documentary filmmaking and things like that at WGBH. Heather and I didn't, didn't overlap there, unfortunately, but we both did some really good work there, both in television and in print. Um, did a lot of long form journalism uh, in magazines and stuff like that. Uh, started, was the editor of the Cape Cod Community Newspaper Group for a while as I got older and wanted to give back to the Cape more, became the founding editor of the Cape Cod Voice, uh, shifted out into um, public policy directly, connecting the same dots. And that's kind of interesting for us today. Became the chief of staff for our state senator, Dan Wolf, working out of the state house, um, and then segued into working right now at the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, helping them with policy, keeping small boat independent guys and women on the water. Every step of the way, whether it was journalistic or in public policy or in nonprofit work, it's really been, as I say, about connecting the same dots. Who makes decisions? How do those decisions translate into a public conversation? Who gets the right to participate in that conversation? Who makes the decisions and why? And how do you work with the decision makers and with the public, which is what you're talking about right now, to make those decisions as um, equitable, looked at through the lens, the prism of 
social and environmental equity as you can. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. For our moment, and I'll be as quick as I can, here's what I see for the organizations that you all represent. The lay of the land in terms of how to relate to the public and how to relate through journalists and journalism has changed dramatically in the last 20 years, let's say. The day of a press release, the day of, of just thinking that you can do print, that you can basically write a really pithy, smart one page thing, send it to a bunch of journalists and it will wind up in your hometown newspaper or maybe get picked up by the Boston Globe and wind up on the, you know, on, in the, in the uh, metro section of a print publication that shows up on people's doorsteps and influences thought is for good and ill, in my opinion, mostly ill, gone. So we all have to start thinking about different ways for, to reach out through the public. So we're talking about social media, right? We're talking about websites. We're talking about the kind of personal relationships that Heather emphasized because we no longer can funnel information through few channels in order to reach a broad group of people. So what that means, I think, for our organizations is that we need to think about making an actual structural commitment within our organizations, as small as they can be, to a point person who's really dedicated to doing this kind of work and thinking about it. I mean, we all uh, imagine, you know, if we have the resources, having a, a donor team or a development group, you know, or uh, a, an executive director. The idea of a communications person whose primary responsibility one way or the other is to do this kind of work, I think is, is fundamental at this point for getting it done. And then once that happens, a bunch of things then happen. Again, I don't mean to repeat what Heather said, but number one, you identify your audience because your audience is not gonna be everybody. Are you interested in reaching out to potential donors? Are you interested in reaching out to decision makers? Are you interested in reaching out to supporters, right? Are you interested in building new supporters? Each time you think that through, it suggests a little bit of a different strategy. And the other thing I would suggest, and I won't belabor it, is that each one of, the, of our organizations has a remarkable message and has a reason for being. We're not just sitting around here trying to raise money for no good reason, right? And so given that, it's really important for us, I think, as organizations to think about creating information about ourselves that is not targeted specifically for one moment or specifically for one you know, narrow thing that I've just defined that also creates a philosophy um, and a consciousness that really makes us all proud. So I'd be glad to share it with you. The example that I've been working on, and I know that Heather does this as well, is at the Fisherman's Alliance, every month we put out uh, an e-magazine. It's called uh, Small Boats, Big Ideas. And what it's built on is an effort to share with the community, you know, four major features a month uh, about, about science, about the environment, about history, about the fishing personalities who we all share and live with, as well as a bunch of small stuff. That goes out every month to about 4,500 people on an email list. And then we take the specific stories that are built there and share them individually with different parts of the community who we think have specific interest in it. It's a fair amount of work, um, but what it does is it creates a platform of credibility and a shared consciousness that just creates tremendous benefit. And you can continue to refer back to that body of work that you're building over time when you're talking with a journalist about a specific idea about climate or about land use or about the blue economy. You can keep referring to that sort of bulk of good work and establish uh, credibility and contacts. So 
that that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I don't know if that really begins to speak to, you know, what people's interests might be. You know, and I'm, I'm very sensitive to the fact that a lot of our organizations are small. Um, and asking for that type of journalistic effort and ongoing expression um, cannot be the easiest thing to do. Um, but uh, I think it bears tremendous fruit if you're willing to think of it as a priority. Uh, so with that, uh, maybe I'll just sort of take a, a step back here and stop hogging the, hogging the stage. And um, Jack, I don't know if you want to be sort of the uh, gatekeeper. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think so. We had a, a couple of questions come in on chat. and Maybe um, I'll just have those people unmute themselves and ask them. And then after that, we have such a small, intimate group that I think if there are any um, additional questions, if you just want to either uh, type something in chat or uh, click the little hand icon or something so that we know you have a question, we, we can uh, have you unmute yourselves and ask your questions yourself. So um, why don't we start with uh, Johnny Robinson had a question uh, for Heather. Johnny, if you want to unmute and uh, ask your question, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. My question is just, um, I'm kind of interested by the idea of like creating a relationship with a journalist um, outside of having a particular uh, like announcement or, um, you know, news release item. Um, so what are kind of like the logistics of how to do that? Uh, like, you know, building those relationships over time? Is it like saying you want to grab lunch sometime or something like how would how would you do that without a journalist feeling like, why are you contacting me? Great question, and I would love to hear Seth's uh, thoughts on this as well. Uh, you do want to be respectful of the fact that journalists are facing crazy deadlines and workloads like we all are, so you don't want to waste their time. But at the same time, yeah, a, a coffee, a get to know you just, you know, hey, we, you know, we work in your town, would love to get to know you and get to know, you know, your beat, what you're covering. Um, what interests you and, and figure out how we can be a resource for your reporting, um, I think is, is one avenue. Another thing that we do, which again, to Seth's point, it, it takes resources, um, but we will often uh, a few times a year uh, looking ahead to, to certain, um, well, events or, or just kind of points in the year where there might be an opportunity to just, um, reach out to journalists, now, most recent example, just kind of new year, um, looking at climate change, um, where we expect uh, the issue to go this year and what might be potential areas of coverage, um, where do we have expertise that might contribute to that. And we just sent out a happy new year as you look forward into your year. We just wanted to remind you, we've got these resources when you're reporting on these issues, we'd, you know, we'd love to talk to you about any of those. So just kind of sending them a menu and a reminder that, hey, we're here in this space. Um, when you're reporting on something, we might be a resource for that. Um, similarly, offering um, kind of briefings is something that we do where in our case, we're kind of going from our institution to say meteorologists and we're almost doing continuing education, right? Here's how climate change shows up in the weather. And these are you know things, background science that might help you understand and blah, blah, blah. I think there are different ways, obviously, that, that groups like, um, like yours might do that. And it might even be something like, hey, get together with a few of the conservation organizations in your town, reach out to the local paper and say, hey, could we all get an hour with you? Just round table, help you get familiar with the organizations that are working in the conservation space in the town, um, feel out where you guys are doing coverage. It would just be a great hour to, you know, to hope, hopefully support your reporting. So those are the sorts of things that, you know, that I think about in terms of, um, ways to build those relationships. And I will tell you that both from the um, organization side now and previously doing this um, uh, from the reporter end at CAI, that hour, hour and a half spent, we did this a number of times, round tables with um, actually, you know, uh, Rich mentioned right whales. We did this, we grabbed half a dozen different um, 
right whale scientists from around the Cape and Islands and three or four of our reporting staff at WCAI. We sat down for about an hour. People didn't want to leave. There was great conversation going. There were so many story ideas that came out of it. There were research ideas that came out of it. Everybody felt like it was really worthwhile. And it ended up catalyzing an entire multi-part reporting series on right whales um, and developed relationships on both ends so that I think the scientists felt more comfortable reaching out to us or saying yes to our requests. And we felt like we had a better lay of the land of exactly who knew what and who we should turn to in any given breaking news situation. So I think they can be a really useful, you know, it can be a really useful hour spent to, to think about the, those kind of things. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that's great. Johnny, I, I don't know your organization. Who, who, who are you working with? I was actually in, invited to this through my, my dad, Mark. So uh, <laughs> that'll do it. So, um, so you might know then that, for example, I just did a long, a long feature about your dad and about the, the compact for um, the Substack that I do, the newsletter that I do. Uh, it's called the Cape Cod Voice. And, That's right, I read uh, that, yeah. Yeah, and, and that was actually generated, of course, from years of personal relationship. But one thing I would say, if people are thinking about trying to develop relationships with journalists is that there's a reason why you're thinking about a particular journalist. Obviously you've seen that person's work or heard that person's work. And one of the first things I found the journalists being humans really appreciate feedback and really appreciate the understanding that somebody out there is actually looking at or in hearing what they're doing. So if you are interested in developing a relationship with a journalist, my suggestion is be responsive to what you've seen. Um, write that person a note, follow up on an article, say, hey, I saw that, nice, nice job. By the way, have you thought about this? Or just, hey, that was really cool. Or by the way, I think you might've missed something on this one. Whatever you wanna say, but begin the conversation by acknowledging the journalistic work that's getting done and then start to think about suggestions, story ideas. Journalists love story ideas. It makes their work better. It makes them feel like they're uh, stretching. And if you come up with a story idea or two that you think based on the work you understand this journalist is doing that he or she might be interested in, suggest it. And use that as the moment to say, hey, I just, I don't know, don't mind me. I just have a few ideas, you know, that I thought you might be interested in. If you'd like to chat about them, would love to. We could have a cup of coffee or we could talk on the phone or we could stare at each other in these little Zoom boxes, whatever it is, and, uh, and just do that. Um, and by, by beginning the process that way, you're acknowledging work, you're showing respect, and you're offering something tangible. You know, I think to, to amplify on that, right, when you think about donors and potential donors, right? You don't just only hit them up once a year and say, hey, give, right? You're constantly thinking about what are touch points? How do I steward this relationship? How, you know, how do I demonstrate impact so that when we do ask, they're gonna wanna give? And I think we've, we've often, um, well, I don't even know who the we would be there. I think often journalists get put in this box of like, they're not really human. <laughs> Um, and I think what Seth's saying is, is really powerful. Like, so think about it in the same way. What are potential touch points? How do you steward the relationship? And don't be worried about them saying no to one story idea. Like that's, you know, the end of the world and the end of the relationship. That was a touch point. They know you're there now. And maybe next time, um, you know, they'll, they'll come back and say yes. Or for that matter, you've put yourself on the radar. They didn't take up that story, but now they know you're there. And that might be in the back of their brain when they start reporting on something else. Great, thanks. Um, for our next question, I think uh, Kevin Galligan as well. Thanks, Jack and Heather. Seth, so wonderful to see you. And I have to say, Heather, even your last comment about we don't even know who they are sometimes. The journalists that we used to call on, like I remember this guy, Seth Robine, when he used to write The Voice. I used to read it cover to cover the day it arrived. I loved it, but now he's gone virtual. Thank you. Um, but no, we could call Doreen have a coffee with her, but the environment has changed so much. And I have to point out that how people even get 
their information. It's almost misinformation. So I only go on Facebook like on weekends because I have no time. And I get so frustrated because of the misinformation. My question, because both of you in what you said about words of respect, integrity, I want us to always control our message with integrity and with so many avenues of misinformation. Again, your words of wisdom are wonderful. Anything we can do to rise above it, as Michelle Obama said? <laughs> I don't know. Heather, you want me to try first? I, oh, I go know. for it. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Um, hi, Kevin. Thank you for all the great stuff you do in this community. Thank you. Um, it's really frustrating. Uh, we could have a national dialogue about misinformation. Um, we could have a local dialogue about misinformation. I think they're connected. And I think it's a fundamental issue for our democracy and for our communities. That said, I, I think for organizations like ours, I think what you have to do is define your playing field. You can't respond to everything. You can't respond in every format. And one of the things I will say, and it's a difficult thing to absorb, is that when you see something that's really, really unfortunate, you know, whether it's vituperative or vindictive or just a flat out wrong thing. The real one of the real questions that we all have to face is when do you respond? And when don't you respond? Because if you choose to respond, two things happen. One, whatever the platform is that where you're responding, you are now defining it as the avenue that people need to turn to, to hear what you have to say. That gives power to that element where you're responding to. You're adding material, you're adding subject matter, fodder, whatever you want to call it, right? And you're probably uh, alerting people who never even saw what was going on to the fact that it was going on. So now you're adding to the audience as well. On the other hand, as we've learned, if you ignore lies, they have a way of multiplying and taking on a life of their own. So the decision about when to intervene and when not to and why is a really difficult one. Um, and I don't really have an answer for that, but I think the high road that you're talking about is really crucial. And I think that the key point is to define the avenues that you choose, whether it's your website, whether it's your Facebook posting, whether it's your social media uh, email list, whether it's your journalistic contacts and stick with them and don't allow yourself to get sidetracked into the mud of all the rest of it. So I wanna zero in on one particular word that you used and that's control, controlling your message. And I think that's such an important thing to consider. And I really wish we were in a room with a whiteboard because I know the limits of my skills and I am horrible on Zoom whiteboard. So I will not torture you with that. But we literally, uh, well, probably a couple of times a year or if we're considering trying something new, um, there, there's a, a graph that we'll actually draw. Put control on the x-axis. Right, how much control you have over the situation, the message, who's hearing it, you know, everything. And on the y axis, put potential impact. And then graph the different things, put, put the different things you could do to get your message out, you know, rank them on those, those two different dimensions control and impact. And what we often find is you can almost collapse that into a, a single dimension that the control and impact are almost exactly inversely related sometimes, right? So you need to, it's, it's a risk reward calculation that you're doing for any given communication activity. So that's talking to a journalist, that's going on social media, that's doing an event, that's um, 
you know, depending on the nature of the event, whether you're going and giving a presentation and there will be moderated screened Q&A versus uh, you're going and giving an event where um, it's a panel discussion uh, where you're just responding to questions and then there's going to be an open Q&A where people can open mic and ask whatever they want, right? Like you can look at these, these dimensions of control and impact um, for pretty much any communication in, uh, that you engage in. And um, not to repeat myself, but I think it really just by dint of the fact that there's more engagement and interaction involved in some of those lower control um, activities, that's also where you have more impact because people are really engaged. And so I think it's, you know, and I think, um, again, there's probably no one silver bullet and this is the right way to do it. Pick your level of control. I think it's more about having a portfolio, right? It's just like investment, like different risk levels in your, in your investment portfolio, right? You don't wanna be all high risk. You don't wanna be all low risk. You're probably gonna to wanna to engage in a range of those um, where you've got some activities that you're gonna to need to prepare for, be ready for what the risks are, but you have the potential for huge impact. And then maybe you're weighted more towards the one where you have more control, but you know it's gonna be more limited impact, but you're really kind of kind of almost like a pyramid, right? Like you're, you're creating a base of like, this is our message, this is here, who we are, we're getting that out there, we're getting that out there so that that's the kind of base. And, and then we feel like we can build on that by doing this higher impact, but higher risk activity because we've got that, that base underneath us. Great, thank you. Uh, for the next question, I think we'll go to uh, John Lamb. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, both of you. It's uh, very great work that you've been doing in many ways over the past. I really appreciate it. Um, land trusts in the past have tended to think it's best to stay in their lane, to try and just focus on protecting pieces of land one by one and not speak out on uses of any other pieces of land or, or, or wider issues too much for fear of uh, alienating some people who might not agree with those positions just to play it safe. But if we wanted to look at strategies to, yeah, it seems like there's, there's a lot of call for us to be uh, a little bit more proactive on a wider basis now with the, the issues of climate change. Uh, do you have any advice in terms of preparing a strategy where we would actually be able to reach out further and minimize the risk of alienating people who don't agree with us politically. Are there, that there are ways to do that that you would advise that, um, that we can consider uh, and also ways to then as assess the sort of relative risks of doing that, uh, of reaching out more versus uh, staying in our lane? Well, John, that's a good question. Um, I'm thinking about the recent experience with the Brewster Sea Camps, which you know you were very much involved in, as a as a moment where the lanes really crossed over yes, at a lot of is. interesting levels, um, and created a remarkable success. Uh, and it may be a, an interesting Harvard Business case study to really analyze how Brewster wound up making that remarkable move. Uh, because I think it's really speaking strategically to what you're talking about um, in terms of, of bringing together everybody from affordable housing to open space uh, to summer camp kids uh, around an issue. Um, I think what I'd say about it is the land conservation movement and the land trust movement is never going to be a movement that embraces every single human, even though it should. And my advice would be to, is to not worry about that. That I think the more uh, partnerships and interactions that conservation movements develop with uh, sympathetic partners of different stripes, the better. It, 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 it doesn't mean you're gonna you know, necessarily you know, get super majorities every time, but it is gonna mean that those partnerships will um, create great synergies. So I would be less concerned about alienating people who might not agree with you to begin with than I would be about building relationships with people who will extend your foundation. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I, I think listening to, to Seth talk about that, I, I think um, I'm not always sure that, that folks on the receiving end of our communications are thinking about our lane in the same way that we might be. Um, if you're talking about your donors or your potential donors, they're giving you money because they believe in what you're doing and they trust you. And um, that means that they're potentially looking to you for thought leadership and not just in this very narrow, like, you know, what, what should we do with this parcel of land that we already own? Should we put trails here? You know, how should, what activities we should do, but looking for you to help connect that to other parts of their life. And I think there's actually a power in reaching out to new people that way by not making land conservation this other, this thing that just some people value land for land, you know, as a, as a standalone kind of thing. And that's just for some people, but helping people connect the dots to the ways that land conservation connects to other parts of their lives, helping them see that connection and feel that connection of like, oh, I am concerned about climate change. And look, they're connecting the dots that, that preserving land ties into climate change. I'm concerned about clean water. Look, they're connecting the dots between land conservation and clean water. I'm concerned about um, equity and justice. And look, they're connecting the dots between land preservation and access to open space um, for disadvantaged communities. Like, you know, so I think there, there's maybe just a way of kind of, of reframing the, the thinking there that it's not so much about getting outside your lane. It's about creating connection and making what you're doing feel interwoven with uh, people's lives in a, in a deeper way. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's great advice, um, actually. Uh, it's it's yeah, more of a sort of educational role of, of you know, taking an objective position, not, um, not just sounding like uh, an activist kind of thing, but uh, having, having good reasoning behind it and leading with the reasoning. Um, and that said, in my experience, um, land conservation can be an incredible way to open doors to more controversial topics. Because if you just lead with talking to somebody about, you know, is there a place that you love or a place from your childhood that you cherish, that is something that so many people can really deeply relate to, that once you open up that like, yeah, there are these places that we love and connect with, that can open conversations to things that, that might feel a little bit less safe or shared. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We have, um, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just add one thing. Seth co congratulated Brewster on uh, its achievement with the major land acquisition. Uh, of course, I should mention that Mark Robinson was the consultant to the board of selectmen. So I think that was a major factor. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I realize we're getting close to 10.30, but I think we got time for uh, one more question. So uh, Bob Granger, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question. Sure, uh, thanks very much to everybody for spending time with us today. I, maybe this builds on the question that John just, just asked. Uh, you know, both uh, Seth and, and Heather encouraged us to think about building relationships with people that might not uh, agree with the main thrust of whatever it is that our message happens to be at the moment. I'm wondering about communication strategies that are better at doing that than others. You know, there's a lot of vehicles for us that are, you know, available to us from social media to print media to other things. And, you know, I'm, I'm just interested in your thoughts about where do, you, where do you go to pick off the next 10 percentage points of the population to help them think about uh, more creatively doing things like land conservation and stewardship? I'll jump in and just pick up from where I left off with my last comment, which is always, if you think you're trying to reach beyond the choir, well, first of all, let's not think about it as reaching out to people who disagree. Let's think about it as starting from a place of something we share um, and maybe realizing that we agree on more than we did before. It's not so much about convincing or converting as, as, as finding shared space. And I would say, um, 
it might happen on social media, it might happen on email, it might happen by events, it might happen in any number of ways, but the way that we do that is we try to decentralize and actually empower um, our board members, our donors, our supporters to actually be that avenue, recognizing that, that the core central we may not be the best messenger to start reaching out. And so it's about creating a network that can spread itself. Yeah, that's wise. Yeah. So Bob, there are a couple of things that I would, if you're thinking about that 10%, you know, like Richie today was talking about the 40, 40, 20, like there's that 20% of land still in play. Right. Well, maybe right. there's, there's like 10% of the population that you're looking to try to understand better what it is you're doing and be supportive of it. I, I think the, I think the best way to reach those people is to identify potential organizations that exist in your community that are already dealing with those people and connect to them. So for example, the non-resident taxpayer associations that so many of our towns have, getting on their agenda some summer evening and just sharing your thinking with them, with that group about what you do, I think gets to those people you're talking about. If you decide as an organization that one of your goals is to visit with your town, a town board of selectmen once a year, just get on the agenda and just give them an update. Like, hey, this is what we've been up to in town. Um, no, no necessary endpoint to the conversation, just a sharing. I think that gets there. Um, I think if you begin to think about other organizations with specific goals, whether it's even schools, you know, um, parent teacher associations and things like that, ways, that, historical societies, ways that you can reach to those people, think a little specifically about their mission and relate it back to yourself and just do it as it comes along, as meetings happen. I think that's how it happens. I think that's very helpful. Thanks very much. Sure. Well, unless there's any final questions, I think uh, we will wrap it up for the day, but I'd like to um, extend a very big thank you to our speakers, uh, Heather and Seth, for taking time out of their busy schedules to uh, be with us this Saturday morning and sharing their expertise. Um, I thank you all as well for participating. I, I know I learned a lot and I hope, I hope you all did as well. And like I said, if uh, you were interested in attending any of the other sessions, um, they are all recorded. So uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email with the links for all those recordings uh, probably in the next week or so. So thank you all very much. It was uh, great to see you all. And um, hopefully you can take some of these lessons and, and implement them with your organizations. Thank you all very much. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Hey, Heather, thank you so much. It was really good to sort of sit side by side with you. That was, yeah, that was it was really a pleasure. Nice. It was a pleasure, thank Seth. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.